So Ezra, <clears throat> Nehemiah, and Esther, the three ex exilic, I think was the word. <laughs> exilic books, post-exilic, sorry. That's what it is. <clears throat> um, and we looked at Ezra. Uh, his name means God helps or helper. Nehemiah's name means comforter. And when we get to Esther, her name can mean star. A lot of people like that. But the uh, Hebrew rendition or translation of, of the name Esther can mean hidden. Uh, which when we get to Esther, the book of Esther, Lord willing, when we get there, the only book in the Bible where the name of God is not used in the whole thing. So interesting how her name can mean hidden because <laughs> it's that message hidden in there. But I, as I pointed out when we started Nehemiah, um, how the Holy Spirit uh, and the work of the Holy Spirit can be seen in the book of Ezra and here in Nehemiah as well. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and causing us uh, to grow, causing us, in this case, to build <laughs> and to repair. The Holy Spirit will, will uh, use you and uses me to repair and to build. And so we noted in chapter 2 at the end there, uh, near the end of the chapter, verse 19, uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and this character Geshem were these this uh, unholy trinity, <laughs> or three bad guys, um, the enemy. You might just uh, sh just take note how they show up as soon as uh, Nehemiah begins to put um, his words. To action. Um, and so we're going to see, as I titled the message tonight, not, not the cleverest title, but if you build it, the enemy will come. <laughs> and we're going to see that. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to see that. Um, if you build it, the enemy will come. So verse 1, <laughs> Nehemiah, <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1. Then Elishab, the uh, high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and they builded the sheep gate. Uh, they sanctified it or consecrated it and set up the doors of it, even unto the Tower of Meh, or the Hundred, the Tower of the Hundred. They sanctified it unto the Tower of Hananel. Verse 2, and next to them, Next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zechar the son of Emri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build, who also laid the beams thereof and, the, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired uh, Merimoth the son of Urija the son of Koz, and next unto them repaired uh, Mush Mushalom, the son of uh, that guy, Berachiah, the son of Meshezelbel, and next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of ben Bena. Um, and next to them, verse 5, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of, the, of their Lord. <clears throat> um, there's going to be a lot of names that I may just skip over uh, for sake of um, not important to, to me or to you uh, here in 2020, but I think it's important to jot down Malachi 3.16 if you don't know already what that has to say. Malachi 3.16 it lets us know there's a book of remembrance for those who feared the Lord. And anytime I come, uh, I think when we started Chronicles, <laughs> remember nine chapters of just names. 
um, brutal reading if you're all alone <laughs> trying to read through the Bible. But it's fascinating how Malachi 3.16 remains. That book of remembrance, that's how God sees us. He takes note of those who put their necks into the work. Now, um, what in verse 5, God notes when we don't put work in. Those who don't, even though they're on the scene, even though they're in the fellowship, they're not putting their back into it. They're not putting their necks into it. And a lot of times the reason is, verse 5, Nehemiah 3, 5, they are noble. What do you mean? Another word for noble could simply be prideful. I don't want to look uh, stupid. I don't want to look weak or poor or like I'm vulnerable. I don't want to do something that's going to that I don't know how to do, quite frankly. Whether it's mopping the floors or vacuuming or cleaning or helping paint. <laughs> there's, there's opportunities like this that come up in the ministry. They're practical things, aren't they? They're very practical when we, when we come to, uh, when we enter into the ministry. Um, it's not all heads bowed, prayers, taking communion, worshiping the Lord, singing, and, and Bible study, taking notes. No, there's practical things, helping someone move, uh, painting, painting the sanctuary, sanding down benches, um, helping brothers out at, at their house, uh, going and, and just, just helping someone out in the fellowship that needs help. Um, practical things. We don't just, we're not so spiritually minded, we're not, we're not of any practical use. Um, but we continue to keep in mind the ultimate goal, which is uh, Christ, which is eternity. We, we set our minds on things above, on things of eternity, eternal value. And we then are used um, as for temporary help for a brother in need, for a sister that, that needs help. So that's what's taking place. It's building and repairing. I think it's important to note those two as we started in verse 1, those that builded the high priests, but then you get to verse 4, those that repaired. Both are needed. Um... These, these, and you're going to see that kind of as we, we continue on. Those who build and make something out of nothing. There's, there wasn't anything there. Now there's a whole wall we're going to see. And then there's those that come along and repair where it has needed. That's, that's an important little distinction to make. Because God, God calls people... To, to have a get-go attitude to get things done where otherwise there wouldn't be a wall if it weren't for that person. But then there's others that are called to come along and just repair what has already been built, what has already had a foundation. They come and make it right. They make it sure. How do you make it sure? How do you make a foundation sure? Is it built on the rock? <laughs> the wise man built his house on the rock. That's the surety. Christ is the surety. Christ is the sure foundation. You can't go wrong. Um, but there's those who are gifted in that special way to just, to just make those repairs when they're needed. And there's those that are gifted to come and make a wall where no one else could put a wall there. But they're, the Lord uses their, their go-get-em attitude. The Lord uses and gifts gives us differently in different ways. And I think that distinction is important to make. Uh, verse 6, moreover, uh, the old gate. There it is again, repaired. <laughs> the old gate would need repairing if it's called the old gate. Jehoiada, the son of Passa, uh, Mesh Meshulam, the son of 
Besodia, Besodia, uh, they laid up the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars. And next unto them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jadon unto the throne of the governor on this side of the river. Next unto them repaired Uziel, um, these guys. <laughs> and you get to the bottom there of verse 8. They fortified Jerusalem unto the broad wall. Now, the broad wall I was reading about in the commentary there would have been the section that Nehemiah himself, uh, it's referred to as the broad wall, and it was a huge section of this wall. And Nehemiah himself had put his, uh, his own hands in, in, uh, into building that section of the wall. So kind of interesting. The broad wall. Verse 9, next to them, uh, repaired Rephahiah, the son of Hur, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. And next unto them, repaired Jediah, the son of Hurumph. <laughs> Hurumph! <laughs> uh, even over against his house, and next unto him, repaired Hattush, the son of Hashabaniah, uh, Malchijah, the son of uh, Hiram, and Hashtub, or Hashub, the son of Pethamiel, Peth repaired the other piece, and the tower of the furnaces. And next unto them repaired Shalom, the son of Halas, the, uh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. He, and note this at the end of verse 12, yeah. and his daughters. Um, we're going to drop back once we finish this chapter and talk about... Um, the diversity that is really true, truly seen. Um, the uh, multi, uh, <laughs> the, the people from all kinds of different walks of life that end up coming alongside. And a word that we're, we're reading over and over is next unto, next unto them. Your uh, new, newer translations may have it rendered differently, but next to them. This is a joint uh, force, joint work that's being done. Um, and, and these gals, these uh, young women, not just women, but young women, were involved in the building of this, this wall. Then we get to the valley gate, repaired Hunan, or Hanan, the inhabitants of Zenoa. They built it and set up doors thereof, locks thereof, and bars thereof. A thousand cubits on the wall unto the dung gate. <laughs> Everybody's favorite gate. <laughs> the dung gate repaired uh, Malchiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Beth, Beth Rechem. <laughs> he built it and set up the doors thereof and locks thereof and bars. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalon, uh, the son of that guy, <laughs> Kol Hosea, the ruler of uh, part of Mezpah, he built it and covered it and set locks, set up the doors thereof and locks thereof and bars thereof, the wall of the pool of Siloa, the king's garden, by the king's garden, and unto the stairs that go up from the city of David. Um, after him repaired Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, the ruler of the half part of Beth Bethzur, unto the pla place over against the sepulchres of David, and to the pool that was made, and unto the mighty, the house of the mighty. And after him repaired the Levites. Um, note, Nehemiah was invo involved. The Levites were involved. Uh, and you have all these uh, names, really, and repetition of next to them repaired, next to them uh, after him repaired, and if you drop down to about verse uh, 26, it's important to note there the Nethanims. Um, that would have been back in the book of Joshua. We bought, brought up those from Gibeon that tricked Joshua, remember, bringing stale bread, and, and, oh, and they were out of water, they claimed to be, but they were right next door. And they tricked Joshua Joshua then uh, really 
put that mark on them, put that task on them that they would be helpers in the house of the Lord, in the work of the Lord, in the work of the ministry. And they became known as the Nethanims. Um, and interesting how something that was bad, seemed like a bad thing, actually probably turned out to be a blessing for these guys to be involved not only in the priest work, which we saw that in Ezra, uh, but here in the physical work and building the wall. Um, so the Nethanims are, are uh, mentioned there to the water gate uh, toward the east, and uh, after them, the Tekoites, Tekoites uh, from above the horse gate, verse 28, everyone over against his house, after them repaired Zadok, uh, the keeper of the east gate, verse 30, after him repaired Hanah, Hananiah, uh, the son of Shelemiah, and all those guys over against his chamber. After him repaired Malchiah, the goldsmith's son, unto the place of the Nethanims and of the merchants, uh, over against the gate, uh, Mifkud, and to the going up of the corner, and between the going up of the corner unto the gate, the sheep gate, repaired the goldsmiths uh, and the merchants. Praise God we got through that chapter. Huh? <laughs> a lot of reading in that. It becomes really exciting here in the next chapter. That's why I wanted to get to chapter 4 tonight because there is some uh, exciting stuff that comes up. And maybe if we were walking with them and looking and yeah. doing all of these things that were being... <laughs> yeah, then it would be a little yeah. more... Oh, being great. able to see who the Nethanims were, or being able to see the, the Tekoites and all these different guys. Kind of like your message this morning, we need workers. <laughs> we do, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the overall message of, of uh, this, cha especially chapter 3, the diversity of these... You had the high priests, and you had the Nethanims, kind of the, the guys that were just kind of dragged along and, and would have been uh, not necessary at one time, not even of the, of the tribe of Israel, not even of the tribe of Judah. Um, and so, and you had well-known nobles, and you had some really kind of, um, well, to be a young woman, daughters of this guy that's mentioned at verse 12, uh, to be a daughter, you'd be like an unknown. Um, very, very uh, kind of look down. We, we forget that, especially in America, where all that uh, equality, all the, the things we've, we've taken for granted over the years, there would be no, I mean, you go to other, other nations, I remember hearing a friend talk about how hearing the, a, a Chinese woman ask her husband for permission to speak. <laughs> that, that is a thing that goes on to this day in another country. And, and yet in America where a woman has, if not more rights than a man, <laughs> it's, it's the only nation where it's, it's just... Uh, people lay it on as if it needs to be. Um, but we know Galatians 3.28. We know that in America, because we've been founded on biblical values, on biblical morals, uh, this, this is like no other nation. And the Word of God is like no other book where you have something like the book of Ruth Name, named a woman, try to find that in the Quran. You're not going to find it. Allah is, is it's, it's completely uh, torn down and, and uh, uh, completely um, dishonors women. And it has, and it's, it continues to this day in other countries. I'm baffled by it. But that's kind of, at this time in history, uh, Women were looked at, and young women were looked at even lower. Um, the rabbis would, would wake up every day and thank God I was not born a woman, and I was not born a Gentile. And 
I think they threw in there, thank you, I'm not a dog. But most of the time they were speaking of Gentiles when they brought up dog. Um, so that's the culture. That's kind of the, the time. And note here, God sees the value in a young woman working in the work of the Lord. She goes out down in history for eternity. These young daughters of this guy, these young women. And Ruth goes down in history, right? <laughs> he must have been a pretty big man, too, because he was a leader of half of the district of Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, the that's, father of the, pretty these, big guy. these gals, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but the diversity, don't miss that in, in, the, in chapter 3. How you have the priests not just doing things uh, in the tabernacle. Now, all the Levites uh, were not priests, but all the priests were Levites. Kind of a fun little uh, brain teaser, right? But it's true. All the priests were from the Levite tribe, but all the Levites had other duties. And we see that here. But even if you were a high priest, like Elisha, um, who, who actually, Eliashib mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 3, is the grandson of uh, Joshua, the high priest, during the time of Ezra that we just went through. Um, you find it in Zechariah. I think it's Zechariah. Uh, where this Eliashib is, is mentioned as his grandson. And you can trace his, uh, him back to that. The Joshua the high priest. Not Joshua... The, the book of Joshua, but Joshua the high priest. Joshua and uh, Zerubbabel. So, um, he's on the scene as high priest, but working to build the sheep gate. And no matter where you are in the ministry, don't ever, i, I never forget the story that I heard from uh, Pastor Clark down in Temecula there, of a young man that had college degrees and he came to visit the church there and they were under construction. You know, uh, Pastor Clark down in Temec Calvary Chapel, Temecula, owned his own construction company before he uh, became a full-time pastor. That's a whole other fun story where God forced him to hang up his hammer and his tool bag. <laughs> and it was a forcing thing. He didn't want to do it. Um, but God finally called him to a full-time just being a pastor. And this young kid came by one day as he's digging the trench. Pastor Clark's out there digging this trench. And no, no joke, true story, the young kid, hey, do you have any openings for jobs here at the church? And Clark, Clark just in his grin, looked over and said, here's a shovel. <laughs> and the kid, just about every, oh, the, the light on his face dropped down to a, sour look and Clark's like what's what's the deal this is perfect perfect timing no I meant something like in the office with paperwork and he said we we can't use anyone like that <laughs> I'm in the office filling out stuff in the papers and here I am in the trenches <laughs> digging trenches if you're not willing to pick up a shovel and get down here in the trenches you're not called to be in an office and shame on those pastors and denominations that look at look at uh, pastoral duties as as a a duty like that, as something that's only in the office. And I wear a tie and a tux and a uh, not a tux but a suit, <laughs> a, a tie and a jacket and this nice clothes because I don't want to get them dirty. What happens if you get a flat tire? If a brother in need has a flat tire, you're gonna Get down on the ground and get dirty changing that spare tire. Oh, I can't do that. I'll call AAA. I'll call AAA, you know. But it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's called work. <laughs> In our... Uh, each generation, I think is getting less and less. I remember the jobs I've had. Um, I was 
I stood out because I'd take out garbage when I wasn't asked to. I would do things just because I had a work ethic ingrained in me as a, as a young kid, that you, you cleaned up after yourself. You did things, and that's looked at today as, wow, <laughs> you stand out. If you do something that, that simple, and we got to remember that with, with the body of Christ, with the work of the ministry, it's going to be hard. There's, there's hard work, sweat, um, time, effort, uh, and the hardest part for some of us, it's with each other. <laughs> Alongside. Uh, as I mentioned this morning, Dad cannot run this church by himself. He's tried. Uh, Mom cannot clean everything at the church on her own. There needs to be this, what we're seeing here in Nehemiah chapter 3. It's called, uh, there's a fancy word for it, isn't there? The gift of administrations. To administer, you're going to be in charge of making the coffee because it tastes great when you make it. <laughs> you're going to be in charge of, of watching over the kids because you're really good with kids and we can trust you. We know that you have this, this good report, even without the church, even it, out there, outside the church, you have a good report. So all these things come into play, and the building is happening. The wall's finally starting to go up. You would think, great, right? Nope, get to chapter 4. <laughs> you know, get, the, it's, the repairs are being made, the building is going up, but... It came to pass, verse 1, Nehemiah chapter 4, that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth or angry and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews what is it with these guys anyways? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? <laughs> Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? You get a little more visual picture of what it was like now because of the, the insults that he's, he's bringing up. And Tobiah, uh, the Ammonite, was by him. And joined with him and he said even that which they build if a fox go up he shall even break in uh, break down their stone wall this wall couldn't even keep a fox from breaking it down mm -hmm. hear O oh, our God uh, for we are despised and turned turn their reproach upon their own heads and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and lot let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. There you have it. They had a work ethic. They knew how to keep going, even if people are telling you to stop, people are yelling at you saying, you're making the, the God angry. You're going against the king, going against the king's orders. You're disobeying. Uh, you're not just leaving it alone. You're making waves kind of a thing. But people had the mind to work. But it came to pass. <laughs> Sanballat didn't let up. And when Sanballat and Tobiah and the uh, Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ash Ashdodites heard the wall, that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, uh, then they were very wroth, again, angry, and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. You might just jot next to verse 8. That is Satan's uh, tactic, has been all along, to hinder and conspire against uh, the building up of others and the building up of the body of Christ, ultimately. Verse 9, Nevertheless, 
I love Nehemiah. We saw this a lot in chapters 1 and 2. Here it doesn't, it's not out of his character. Nehemiah, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, the strength of the barriers of, the, uh, of bur burdens is decay, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries say, said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. They're willing to do, uh, you know, they can see the heart of their adversaries. Uh, wanting to, to just stop the work. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them uh, came, they said unto us ten times from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore set I in the lowest lower part places behind the wall and on the higher places. I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, or you could say mighty, <laughs> and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. And it came to pass, verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to nothing, to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both spears and shields and bows and uh, hard haberdines. Uh, the rulers were behind all the houses of Judah, swords, uh, holding their, their weapon in hand and also building. So they built, uh, they which builded on the wall and they that bear the uh, burdens with those that la laid it. Every one with his, one of his hands uh, wrought in the work and with the other hand held up a weapon. Verse 18, for the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side and so builded, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said unto the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye there thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spear from the rising of the morning until the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, I said, uh, said I unto the people, Let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be on gu a guard to us, and labor on the day. So neither I nor my brethren nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that every one put them off for washing. So the only reason they went home was to take a shower, <laughs> to wash. This was their life. Um, is it any wonder that we're reading this the day before Labor Day? I couldn't have planned it. Is there somewhere that we can find out how long that took to rebuild the walls? Oh, to... Uh, you probably can. I didn't, but you probably can figure that out. I would, who's the historian? That, uh, uh, Josephus. Josephus. Might uh, yeah, he might have... have and, and you may just be able to find it from the, from the Bible. Google it. Yeah, or Google it. <laughs> but, yeah, the, the, that's... Um, this, this would have been, and you find out that it was halfway, uh, the wall was halfway up. The enemy was, was even more upset 
Um, I think that's in the next couple of chapters or something. But the, the, the wall ends up being halfway up before the enemy expected it to be. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely, when it's the work of the Lord, and he's, he's delegating, he's in control, when prayer is behind it, which it, this, from chapter 1, we've seen, Nehemiah, this man of prayer, that that's where the power is. It's in prayer. Um, I wrote next to that, uh, his response to them mocking, to them scoffing. Uh, it says 52 days. Oh, 52 days to, to make the uh -huh. wall. They understood the urgency of rebuilding the wall. Yeah. Yeah, the urgency. Um, actually, what's interesting and what can be uh, looked at sometimes is, is these walls had been, and we I said how in, in the insult, you see that it was burned down in this rubbish, which are burned at the end of verse 2, uh, Nehemiah 4.2, the very end there. Um, you get kind of a visual of the incredible uh, just hopelessness. Um, we're all well too familiar here after the fires we've had in the Tubbs fires. And you go and you see the rubble and just the, it's been leveled. Um, and you think, is there hope to even begin to build again? The enemy was feeding on that and was saying, look at this. This is nothing but uh, rubbish and, and just rubble. There's, there, you can't build on that. That's dead. You know. Um, the enemy does that. Uh, these walls had been torn down and they needed to be rebuilt. Some would say, tear the walls down. Man. get rid of the walls walls are terrible they come between you and others and you need to take those walls down in the name of love and Bono and <laughs> all that is good take the walls down no walls are good walls are necessary especially in the bathroom. Would you agree? <laughs> if walls were not necessary, if walls were not good, <laughs> we wouldn't have a roof over us right now. Take the walls down. you got to watch out. Now, we understand it to a degree. We do build walls up and keep people out from coming in emotionally. But walls are a good thing. And even, he, even spiritually speaking, there is a distinction that needs to be made. There needs to be a wall or a line that should not be crossed. In Jerusalem, in this case, they needed a wall to keep what? The enemy out. Otherwise, you are vulnerable. In our hearts, we set up and fortify with prayer, we put walls up around our children, around this church building, around our families. That's our form. Ephesians 4, or 6, sorry, Ephesians 6, 18. I wrote that next to, uh, I was looking for the verse there. Um, uh, verse 9, uh, Nehemiah 4, 9. Next to that verse, you can write Ephesians 6, 18. Uh, praying always. In Ephesians 6, that chapter, that great chapter of spiritual warfare, spiritual war, but we, we often overlook that in, in Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always. Not, okay, we've, we've done this. Okay, I've given it to the Lord. I'm done with that now. Praying always. It's such an, a necessity for us to come to. Walls are, 
necessary. Um, they need to be uh, not just built, but repaired. Um, and also, taking this way back to chapters 1 and 2, there is an agonizing before and organizing. I forgot to mention that. I meant to mention that at the beginning of uh, this message of the study. But there was agonizing before organizing. What do you mean? When Nehemiah heard what had happened, that the walls had been destroyed, that everything, that the temple did not have any kind of protection around it, any kind of walls. But the city of Jerusalem, though they had been able to come back into their land, had been a, a wreck. And so he agonized. He was, he was in great humility before, the, before he goes to the Lord in prayer, and the Lord then begins to set organization, which he always does. We, we uh, worship a God of order and can bring order out of chaos. Um, but another thing that's kind of neat, you can do it in your own time or just kind of, uh, I uh, came across it looking through the John Corson's commentaries on this. And, and you see, it is really cool because you can see uh, these gates in chapter 3 that we've already looked at as a, an outline for a, your walk with the Lord. Salvation. Um, the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of God always starts at, chapter 3, verse 1, the sheep gate. Those who enter, enter by me. John chapter 10. Yeah, John 10. The sheep gate. To come unto Him. Um, in Isaiah 53, 6 is, is a scripture to jot down. The sheep gate. All we like sheep. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Until we realize that we are messed up. That we are not good. We are bad <laughs> sheep. We come to the sheep gate. That's where we start. And we become... One of His. So He's the shepherd. And that's where we, we begin our journey. And then He makes us, and I like the fish gate. Verse 3, we got and saw chapter 3, verse 3, the fish gate. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus, we all know, saying, I will make you fishers of men. Interesting to note in that, not you will go out and be a fisher of man, or you go and, and uh, start street witnessing now. No, I will make you fisher of men. In other words, it's just going to happen. You will begin to be uh, it's his work. attractive yeah. to those. And, and uh, you'll, you'll begin to look different to the world. He's just made you that way. It just, it just begins to happen. They don't see you at the clubs where they used to see you. And they wonder what's going on. They're, they're baited a little bit. They're starting to see this difference. You're a little shiny. <laughs> they're starting to see the light that's coming through. And you're starting to, to get them. Not that you're trying at it. You're just walking with the Lord. You're just one of His sheep. One that belongs to him. But then he uses you as the fish gate, bringing in the, those that don't know. And then you uh, get made fun of. Um, and verse 6, they say, there's no way. You're a Christian. That's uh, my great, 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 great grandma was a Christian. Come on. That's the old gate. And they start mocking you and scoffing you. Some, some have walked away from the faith being offended and thinking, oh, I'm just outdated then. But Jeremiah 6.16 is a good one to jot down next to verse 6. In Jeremiah 6.16, Jeremiah was made fun of <laughs> quite a bit for being of, of the old 
gate. And in Jeremiah 6.16, he says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is that is where the good way is, and walk therein, and find rest for your souls. We don't want these new idols, especially in the days of Jeremiah. These, these, uh, these just kind of out there, false gods and false, and they called them new. They still do today. There's a whole movement, New Age. That, that every wacky teaching that's out there you get you can get into. Give me that old time religion. Give me the old ways. Yeah, that's right. I believe what my great 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 grandpa believed. I believe what they believed that I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. We believe this with all our heart. Why? Because we know His mercies, though they are old, ancient of days, they are new every morning, aren't they? They're living. They're powerful. His mercies and His Word. It's manna. It's like every day, it's fresh. But I can't, can't pinpoint it. I can't put it in a box and like him. He is the bread of life that comes down, right? Don't try to box it up. Don't try to formulize it. Make it into a, a cute little display. Uh, so that's the, <laughs> the old gate. Um, and then you get... Of course, you press on, verse 13, you get to the valley gate. None of us like that gate. But he is, like that old song we sing, he is the God of the mountain, and he's the God of the valleys. It is important for us to go through valleys, to get into the valley gate. It's important for us to go through that valley. As Psalm 23, David wrote, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You say, well, how could you make sense of the dumb gate? <laughs> because like Paul, we look at everything we've, quote unquote, accomplished, everything that we've put Aside, in Philippians 3.8, I count it as, what? Dumb. Not even to be compared. It's just dumb at the gate. And that speaks, I just wrote next to it, confession. When I have dumb <laughs> in my life that needs to be confessed, after the valley so often, after the time of closeness with Him, we, we know we need to confess. And then what happens? We get to this valley of the, uh, or the gate of the fountain, verse 15, where Jesus said in John 7, 38, out of you will gush torrents of living water. you got to get rid of the dung before you get to the fountain. <laughs> Before that living water can start to go like that, empty me, empty me, empty me. Then he's able to fill you, isn't he, with his living water. But yeah, you can go through these gates. There's the horse, the, uh, the water gate. That's the word of God and the horse gate where he is then the strength of your life. Amen? Um, the water gate there uh, is verse 26, and the horse gate is in verse 28. Um, and we can't walk in the Spirit unless it's by His Spirit, in His might, in His power. I can't do it on my own strength. There's no way. 
I'm hopeless. There's, I don't have the ability for that. So that's the horse gate speaks of uh, walking in the Spirit, moving in the Spirit, doing the work of the Lord that needs to be done. Um, but we do get in chapter 4, so that was just a really neat outline that you can go through in, ch in chapter 3. But then you get confronted with the enemy. Um, who are the people involved in the work of the Lord? Today it is called the church. There are spectators that come and just spectate. They come into the church. Oh, I don't really like the hymns. They're singing hymns. I, that's kind of dead. And they start to kind of complain and do this and that. And how tragic. Because you can, <laughs> you can be the solution. You can go and volunteer and be the next worship leader <laughs> there. And bring some new songs in. They start to come alive. Or the other way around. Oh, can't stand all, all these new songs. I have no idea what any of these songs are. Where's the old hymns? That's where the real stuff is. Not one is right or wrong. It's you can't just, please them. <laughs> it's just different taste. Yeah, you can't please all the people. It's me and Dad been going down to the Redwood Gospel Mission for years. We've been going down there. And one thing we, we've gotten so used to saying is we do not take, uh, what is it when they call out? Requests. We do not take requests. What do you mean? I, I love it when you guys play that song. You know, and they do. They request that we play this, this song that they know and they love, and we're not doing it for you. It's a great reminder. I'm not doing it for you. I'm not doing it for you. What are you doing the work of the Lord for? Why are you coming to church? So I can get what I want. So I can get... <laughs> and we, we forget, don't we? We come to serve, not to be served. Like He, the ultimate example of our, of our walk... All of these guys served. And then you find these who are called noble. <laughs> and is it no wonder uh, Paul, I should have jotted down the, the reference, uh, homework assignment. <laughs> Paul would write, not many noble. There are noble that come to know him and come and, and are in the body of Christ. There are great, there are powerful, noble, not many rich, not many noble. Why? Because they have a tendency, don't they, to get, well, I'm above that. I can't be cleaning the toilets at the church. Ugh, I can't be wiping down the windows and doing this and that. I can't vacuum. That's for the maids. That's for the... You know, I'm, I, I have a house cleaner that I pay for that. And wife? <laughs> I have a wife. I have a woman I married now. You're going to get me in trouble. I'm going to tell you. Don't you do that. But um, how important it is, it is for us to realize that I'm no better and that we're all in this together. Not COVID. The work of the Lord. Because you're hearing that out there everywhere. We're all in this together. We're going to get through this together. We have, we the church could not be, we could not exist if we did not have one another. That scripture the Lord laid on uh, me and Jess that we are one body in Christ and members of one another it's such a strong reminder to us that I couldn't exist without you 
that I would be dying spiritually. I wouldn't have a relationship with God that was meaningful if it weren't for you, if it weren't for me, if it weren't for us. They could not build this wall which needed to get built if it wasn't for these families coming together, fighting and pleading. And it got to the point where they're holding spears and holding swords in one hand and the trowel in the other. Holding the, the uh, shovel in one hand and holding and fighting off the enemy with the other hand. And setting up, watch, uh, Pastor Chuck, Chuck, Pastor Chuck Smith had a whole sermon, and it's a great one, on, on just his prayer in verse 9. Uh, that we made our prayer unto God and set a watch. And he goes into, it's not enough to just pray. Have you set the watch? <laughs> and it's not enough to just set the watch. Have you prayed? Those two go hand in hand. You don't just, well, we prayed about it, but we didn't do anything practical. <laughs> We didn't set any guys to watch over anything. Or we go out there with, you know, a hundred men with no prayer. Either, either way is, is not, uh, it's, it's, it can be much better when it's in his hands praying, and we truly have put it in his hands, and then when we've, when we've taken his instructions and put it to, into action, put it into application, right? We, we read what they've done here, and then we go our way, and we begin to build those walls and those gates and those uh, fortresses by prayer, supplication. But prayer without actions is dead. Yeah. Amen. Somebody said, what is truth? What is truth? Well, Pilate asked that, didn't he? With Jesus, but men's study, we're going through John um, and getting right up into that section with Pilate and Caiaphas and Jesus, the trial that Jesus goes to. And Pilate, in one uh, case, says, what is truth? And the greatest definition I've heard is, Truth is when the word and the deed become one. Amen. That is truth. When the word and the deed become one. And that is Jesus. Amen. Here's a man who did everything he said. And then some. <laughs> In fact, the way the Gospel of John ends, if all the things that he did were recorded, the whole world couldn't contain the books that, that would be in that. And we understand. And these guys would be men, women, sons, daughters, husbands, wives, who fought for the Lord, fought for His nation. And God blessed their families because of it. God, in this, is bringing them closer together. It doesn't feel good. And I love the old uh, story of the hammer. The hammer that's told, you know, you gotta, you got to leave the church. You're really too heavy and hard on people. You have to just leave the church. Of course, the hammer says, well, if I go, then the screwdriver has to go. He's screwy. He's always twisting people and turning here and turning there. And so the screwdriver's got to go. So the screwdriver then, well, if I got to go, I've the sandpaper really has to go because he's always rubbing people the wrong way. <laughs> and you go down the list and I think there's a, the ruler has to go because he's always measuring people up and down and, and it, it, they're complaining. He's got to go. And of course, then in the end, 